I came to the Best Lab as an undergraduate in bioengineering and wandered around and found Alice in the hallway and she opened up her laboratory to me to explore different research and uh, was a recipient of the President's Undergraduate Fellowship also with the help of Alice and became a lifelong mentor as I mentioned through my master's and PhD. Uh, the work I'm gonna talk about today is taking place at the Lawrence Hall of Science, which is the Public Science Center of UC Berkeley. And this is one of my NSF projects, which I co-developed with the Tech Hive teens, uh, which you had a chance to be in that space yesterday. So the title of my talk is called Paper Mechatronics, Creating High Low Tech Design Kits for Engineering Education. And this is my team. Uh, it's a collaborative team of engineering educators, media designers, teams, as well as the Craft Technology Lab at the University of Colorado uh, Boulder. So some of the challenges that we're seeing is that learning is largely teacher driven rather than interest driven and driven by the, uh, that's very learner centered. And the current materials that are being offered are very limiting in terms of their level of expressivity, being able to construct ideas, construct personal narratives, um, and they have limited adaptability and accessibility. Um, a lot of you are familiar with robotics kits um, and robotics competitions that are just incredibly inspiring, but they again are mostly too expensive for most families, both in terms of the material resources that you need as well as the social supports needed to, to pull off a competition. Um, and also, in general, the culture of robotics tends to be very competitive, and there aren't really other ways of participating in this. So the big question we're asking here is how do we broaden the participation of all kids so they can learn engineering, uh, specifically robotics and mechatronics? Um, so just defining a little bit about what mechatronics is, I think a lot of you already know what that is, is really the design of microprocessor-based mechanical systems. It's real-time computing, understanding feedback and control, um, designing mechanical systems that are responsive to the environment and the sensing environment. And so what I'm trying to do is marry mechatronics with this culture of craft making, which is taking over the, the maker movement right now. And uh, craft making is really inviting, it's very interest driven, it's around communities, it's very joyful and very hands on. And so we're trying to marry these two traditions. Uh, so you might be asking why paper? Well, uh, paper is a ubiquitous item that you can find in most home schools and even cafeterias. Uh, almost every free lunch program comes in different boxes and there's always uh, waste that comes out of that and there's always available cardboard and material. Um, as I mentioned earlier, paper crafts is a very long tradition of uh, being able to construct joyful toys, things that are very familiar with kids, um, origami, paper airplanes, paper dolls, things that you can really touch and feel in front of you. It's very tangible. Um, it's also very easily adaptable in that you can decorate it, you can add feathers. There's different ways of customizing it in a way of, of being expressive in your learning. Um, we are very interested in um, trying to develop a material uh, typically in the maker movement, you have teams of kids that come together and they build these incredible projects. But at the end of this, both as a parent, what do you do with these projects at the end? Um, and as a teacher, when you generate like multiple projects, you really don't have a place to store them and you want them to be able to, to be recyclable and find their way back into the environment either by disassembling them or being able to recycle them. Um, so we have some strong reasons for why we'd like to use paper. So a little bit about our uh, framework. Uh, this is an emerging design framework that we've been looking at of trying to understand what is hard about learning mechatronics and what's easy, and what are the things we can scaffold through the intentional design of the material, the programming environment, the particular board that you're using. Um, so you know the standard uh, uh, layout here is that we have a number of inputs. Uh, we understand that we're gonna need some control we're gonna need different kinds of outputs and different kinds of uh, mechanisms here. Uh, and so we've been doing this exploration where the, uh, we're trying to focus on the things that are um, good for learning, but remove the things that are what we call the bad hard. So focus on the good hard parts, are really focusing on the mechanical reasoning, the programming and problem solving, and less about the um, things that are kind of hard, like breadboarding, syntax, 
um, requiring tight tolerances for you to put things together. And we're aiming, as I mentioned, low cost, uh, trying to kind of find some common digital fabrication tools as well as paper-based materials. So in this exploration of this project, uh, we have uh, developed some different laser cut components. Uh, this is a work of a graduate student that I'm co-advising, uh, Hyunju Oh, uh, who's in Colorado, and has developed these uh, kits for developing percussive instruments and running workshops. So trying to come up with some, some forms that one might be able to put these materials together. Uh, we've been also exploring modeling tools. So in the same process that robotics engineers follow is you do a lot of computational modeling ahead of time to model what is the physical motions that you would like to have and trying to understand what are the basic forms that you might find that would be interesting for constructible projects. Uh, in this case, we were inspired by Theo Jansen's work who develops a strand beast on the beach. It's this huge wind structure that uses wind power. Uh, that you use and you can do the modeling, you can add one or two or four or a, a number of legs. And then this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is all sent out on a, a paper cutter or a laser cutter and then you can do the assembly and then the layering of the electronics later. Um, we've also done some um, projects, this is the work of Joel Rosenberg who started this uh, project early, which is to make the representations and the annotations of learning electronics explicit on paper uh, that you can print out as PDFs and then you can paste it onto uh, cereal boxes and cut them out and these are each about uh, this big and this is uh, developing subsystem and components where you can layer on information, uh, sorry, components and then through these little binder clips um, and copper tape, you can put them together. And on the right, you see a tracing bot that was put together with three different components and, a, and another serial box. So this is sort of the, the tradition of what we're trying to um, move towards is that there's really kind of the high tech of the high tech electronics, the laser cutting, all the incredible tools that we have at our, 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 our hands, but we're really staying very low tech to bring the cost down. Uh, this is an early kit that we assembled using a hummingbird board um, and some laser cut components and some mounting to try to figure out if we can use kind of just the basic things of a servo motor, a couple of these make-do fasteners, um, and a different set of sensors. And what you see is we have a huge range of narratives that come out of this project. You, you don't see necessarily just the battle bots of robotics. What you do see are um, a whack-a-mole design where um, you know, kids can like pop up through a hole and you can whack their heads. Uh, you see uh, an elephant whose trunk moves when you pet it. Uh, we have these uh, responsive origami flowers that open up. Uh, one of my teens developed this Snape mask. It was very inspired by Harry Potter. And so what happens is it's called a sneezing Snape. So if you like tickle his nose with a feather, because uh, there's sensors built into the nose, the eyes flash and it sneezes and it makes a sound. Um, and then here's another project. Uh, this is one of my engineering educators, AJ, who graduated from the engineering department here at Berkeley, uh, who developed a DIY, a do-it-yourself New Year's hat. And so you can trigger the ball to fall down on your own hat on New Year's Day. But these are the kind of compelling narratives that we think are very interest-driven, which is why a lot of kids who are your non-usual suspects who are interested, who might be interested in engineering, we can hook them and get them interested and engaged. Um, and then bring in the, the more difficult concepts of the programming and the engineering around that. Uh, as part of this NSF grant, uh, we've done a lot of explorations. Um, we've built a, a tiki room full of lots of different flowers that were very responsive. The teens each made a little flower and it came together as a nice garden that was very responsive. Uh, we did a cereal box hackathon. Um, we made robotic theaters out of business um, uh, staples boxes, um, those office boxes. So you can actually turn them into little interactive robotic theaters that the doors open up. Uh, we've hosted hackathons to look at uh, how do you do some sort of competitive cooperative model um, and introduce this into high school. So we've worked largely in informal settings, uh, science museums, and are very interested in moving this into high schools. Uh, and we did a small experiment uh, in a local high school um, to work with a physics teacher to see how could we take 
the kind of richness of vapor mechatronics and start putting a scope and sequence around it, as well as looking at kind of deeper assessments so that teachers can adopt this kind of low cost model of doing engineering education. This is a, a, a lovely uh, uh, event that we did where our Tech Hive teens uh, ran a number of tutorials with other teens in the Bay Area to broaden their impact and brought a robot petting zoo. So the kids were given 18 hours uh, over two days to invent an animal in a team, get it to work, and they had different categories of the wildest, the hungriest, the most dangerous um, as categories for design. And then they had a huge display and invited the public to celebrate in their design and also as a way of getting feedback. All right, so a little bit about the data. Um, I used a assessment that was developed at the Lawrence Hall of Science that me measures activation and science learning, and this is a psychometrically tested uh, assessment to look at different aspects of uh, one's engagement, interest, fascination, values uh, in science. And we used this assessment with the students within the robot petting zoo um, and looked along these four factors of innovation stance, competency beliefs, which is I believe I can do these things, I believe I'm a competent person, and found that there were significant differences just in an 18 hour period of doing the robot petting zoo. Um, I would really like to show some more videos, so I'm gonna actually quit and try to get back onto the internet here uh, to show you the uh, robot petting zoo that happened at the Creativity Museum, as well as at the uh, Oakland uh, Lighthouse Charter School. So this is, a, this is a, uh, at the end of the event. This is a robot petting zoo. The robots were made by high school participants in what we call a makeathon or a making marathon. Most of these participants never built with cardboard, engineered a mechanism, or programmed before. This is the story of an 18 hour makeathon and the people that made it possible. Seven months ago, Alona and Sam, two of our Tech Hive interns, had an idea. What if Tech Hive ran its own hackathon? Only, what if we made it very beginner friendly? It wouldn't be a typical hackathon. So instead, we wanted to create a makeathon. We tested the idea on the main floor of the Lawrence Hall of Science for a robot petting zoo, and the results were encouraging. With the help of Ming, our Tech Hive intern and fundraising guru, we raised some money. We secured a space. The Tech Hive teen interns trained seven adult mentors, and we recruited 17 teen participants. The participants were from all over the Bay Area. Now there's only one thing left to do, run the makeathon. <laughs> Actually, I won't show you all of this video except to say that this was an incredible model of learning that helped support engineering education and also broaden the participation to help teens teach other teens, while at the same time folded in my research to be able to test uh, the paper mechatronics work. Uh, we did take this to uh, a local high school and collaborated with a the teacher there and it was really interesting to see uh, that uh, the, your usual suspects who are, um, as this teacher had described to me, were largely disengaged, who did the absolute minimum amount of work, who had some truancy issues at school, uh, were willing to come back and even go to the fabric store and get additional fabric to work on these projects because they cared so much about their animal, which embodied something that they cared so much about that was very interest-driven, that was their entryway into learning robotics and programming. And so we think that this is a really powerful model for doing this. Um, so I guess I want to conclude by saying that this is a really toe-in-the-water, really early experiment uh, that we're that we're doing in paper mechatronics, because um, we're trying to envision, as I mentioned, a very expressive technology-enhanced medium where we want to, to design a medium, a support system, and an environment such that all learners can learn mechatronics while also imagining um, what they can do with the affordances of paper. So thank you very much.
Okay. Kenneth, are you ready? Um, as uh, Sherry is transitioning, we're setting up. Do you have, is there a quick question for Sherry and her paper robots? I have a quick question. Yes, Adrian. Thank you. So I'm just curious, why were you anti breadboard? Because the cardboard breadboards actually seemed rather difficult. I love the idea of being able to do it once, and I think breadboarding is a really powerful way of learning things, um, especially laying out that cardboard. But when it came down to I'm spending my 20 minutes punching holes into cardboard, and they're not really understanding the relationship of the components, that's where we started kind of losing interest. And so doing it once is great, but doing it repetitively is where you started, the learning loss started to happen. So I'm not completely against breadboards, but oftentimes that if a kid has a problem with a breadboard and you have 36 in the classroom and there's basically, um, you know, they don't understand polarity and that's, that's good to diagnose, but they get very frustrated and they've lost 45 minutes because they didn't figure out how to reverse the, 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 um, the sensor, that's a problem. 